Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to begin talking about the muscles of the pelvic floor. And to do that, we'll start by talking about the perineal muscles. When most people consider the pelvic floor muscles, they're normally thinking of the levator A9 muscle group, which is actually the deepest layer of the pelvic floor. We're going to start more superficially by going over the perineal muscles. And the most helpful way to learn all of this is by starting superficially and just peeling off one layer at a time, seeing what tissues we go through. All right. So to get some perspective of what we're looking at, first of all, we're basically looking at the bottom of the pelvis. Okay. So imagine you're lying on your back on the ground and you're looking directly up at the ceiling and a person then comes and stands directly over your head. Well, you're looking up like this and so our view is going to be inferior to superior. Okay. So that means that the most superficial tissue is going to be the most inferior and as we go up superiorly, we're actually getting deeper and deeper ultimately into the pelvic cavity. So what's our most inferior tissue here? Well, it's also our most superficial tissue in this case, and that is the skin. And so we're going to peel off the skin figuratively, and what that means is we're going superiorly. We're getting deeper and deeper. And that's going to expose the subcutaneous fat. Nothing too interesting with the subcutaneous fat. If we go a little bit deeper, a little bit more superior, we'll get to our first layer of fascia. That's our fascia of collies. And then if we peel that off, go a little bit more superior deeper, we get to the superficial perineal fascia. Now up to this point, we haven't seen any muscles. Once we peel off this layer, the superficial perineal fascia, and go a little bit superior, a little bit deeper, we're going to get to our first layer with actual muscles. And that's what we're going to see right now. So let's discuss some of these muscles, and there's four of them in this layer. The first is this STP right here. That is the superficial transverse perineal muscle. So there's one on each side, as you can see, and we can see that in the picture right here, just labeled as transverse perineal, but it's superficial transverse perineal. Then we have this one right here, which also attaches to the perineal body. There's actually two of them technically, but I've just drawn one for the sake of space. This is called bulbospongiosis, and you can see a couple of them right here. Here's the left bulbospongiosis, and then here's the right bulbospongiosis. You can see that via its posterior attachment, it's partially on that perineal body right there. Then we have a muscle here that doesn't attach to the perineal body. This is the ischiocavernosis. Again, there's a left and right for both of these. You can see it over in the picture here. Left ischiocavernosis and right ischiocavernosis. And then this muscle that's posterior to the perineal body is the external anal sphincter right here. Now, if we look at the area that's sort of bounded by the superficial transverse perineal muscles here in the perineal body, and then each of these ischiocavernosus muscles, this really constitutes what we call the superficial perineal pouch. This is a potential space between the perineal membrane, which is superior, we haven't seen that yet, and the superficial perineal fascia, which is inferior. Remember, we just peeled this layer off, so that was inferior. Then we get to this layer, which is the superficial perineal pouch, and then once we go to the next layer, which is a little bit superior and therefore a little bit deeper, that will actually be the perineal membrane. Okay? Now in any case, the superficial perineal pouch contains the greater vestibular glands, or also called Bartholin's glands, and also the erectile tissues that form the penis and clitoris, and these three muscles that we just talked about. And it's bounded posteriorly, not only by these superficial transverse perineal muscles, but the perineal body right here. Now before we peel off this layer and go to the perineal membrane, let's spend a little bit of time on these muscles right here. The first one we'll talk about is the ischiocavernosus. Of these three right here, this is the only one that doesn't attach to the perineal body. Okay? So ischiocavernosus. Now its origin is on the ischial tuberosity and the ischial ramus. So here's your ischial tuberosity, not labeled in this picture. And the ischial ramus is going to go along here. Okay. So you can see that muscle originate there, and then the insertion is going to really depend on the gender of the person. If the person is male, it's going to insert on the crus of the penis, and if they're female, it's going to insert on the crus of the clitoris, which of course is the female homologue of the penis, right? 
And the innervation of the ischiocabernosis is the deep branch of the perineal nerve, which has nerve roots S2 through S4. And the action of ischiocavernosis is to push blood from the root of the clitoris, or the penis, which is more proximal to the body of that structure, whether it's the clitoris or the penis, more distally. So it helps to maintain blood flow in those structures, which helps to maintain the erection in both males and females. Okay, so that's the action of ischiocavernosis, very much a sexual function in nature. And its blood supply is through the perineal artery. Now over here we have bulbospongiosis. Okay. Bulbospongiosis' origin is dimorphic. So in males, the origin is on the perineal body and also the median penile raphe. Now this picture over here is for a female perineum or female pelvic floor. If we look at the two bulbospongiosis right here, notice there's a pretty large space in there. And that space is to accommodate the vagina. Obviously, in males, there is no vagina, and so this hole right here is not necessary. And so in males, the bulbospongiosis muscles are pushed close together and actually connected at the midline through what's called the median penile raphe. Okay? However, in females, we have this space right here to accommodate the vagina. And so for that reason, the two muscles right here do not connect in the middle they connect up here at the origin only at the perineal body. Okay? But in males, it's the perineal body and the median penile raphe. We'll see a picture of that in a couple of slides. The insertion is also dimorphic. So in males, uh, this muscle partially inserts on the perineal membrane, which we have not seen yet. Also, the dorsal aspect of the corpus spongiosum and corpora cavernosa, uh, singular would be corpus cavernosum, uh, these are structures actually within the penis uh, that give it some um, bulky structure, and also the fascia of the bulb of the penis. Okay? In females, the insertion of this muscle is the pubic arch, which we actually see right here. Here's the pubic arch, okay? and also the fascia of the corpora cavernosa and the clitoris. Okay? So the clitoris also has these structures as well. Just like ischiocavernosis, bulbospongiosis is innervated by the deep branch of the perineal nerve, and its action is also dimorphic. In males, bulbospongiosis compresses the bulb of the penis during urination and ejaculation. So in that way, it helps to force out a little bit of extra fluid. So if it's urination, force out extra urine. If it's ejaculation, force out a little bit of extra semen so it doesn't get maintained within the urethra because obviously in males, the urethra serves both functions of sexual and urination, right? It also assists in erection of the penis with ischiocavernosis and helps to support the perineal body. Again, it originates on the perineal body, so it helps to support that tendon. In females, it assists in erection of the clitoris and the bulb of the vestibule, and it also supports the perineal body because in both males and females, that's part of the origin. Here's another look at these muscles, except this picture is flipped compared to what we saw before. So right here in males, we see the two uh, bulbospongiosis muscles, and notice that they are connected because they are attached to this structure in the midline right here called the median penile raphe. But in females, because we have to accommodate the vagina, the bulbospongiosis muscles are actually separate in the middle, but then they come back and originate together off of that perineal body, which in the picture is right there for females, right here for males. And we can see the ischiocavernosis muscle right here. Here's another one. And we can see those in women as well over here. And then these muscles right here, which run transversely, those of course would be the transverse perineal muscles. And that leads us to talking about those. So the transverse perineal muscles originate on the tendinous fibers from the inner and forepart of the ischial tuberosity. So again, here's your ischial tuberosity labeled in this picture. And here is one of the transverse or superficial transverse perineal muscles. You can see it originating off of that. And then the fibers run medially to the perineal body. And so what we see here, especially in females because of the space between the bulbospongiosis muscles, we actually see that these muscles kind of orient themselves in a figure eight with the perineal body in the center. And then the superficial transverse perineal muscles attaching laterally on the perineal body like this. Okay? Superficial transverse perineal muscles are innervated by the deep perineal nerve, same thing as before. 
and their action is to constrict both the urethra and the vagina in females, which helps to maintain urinary continence. So whenever you're trying to hold your urine, like you're trying to make it to the toilet, right? You're running into your house after you just drove home, you're contracting the superficial transverse perineal muscles, also the deep ones that we haven't seen yet, and those are helping to constrict the urethra and prevent you from urinating in your pants, okay? Let's keep going now. So we're gonna peel off this layer, go a little bit more superior, a little bit deeper, and now we're gonna reach what's called the perineal membrane, okay? So the perineal membrane, we still have that perineal body there in the center because it connects all these layers now. Uh, we see a hole here to accommodate the GI system, really the rectum, right? Then we have a hole here to accommodate both the urethra and in females, the vagina as well. So what we see here is that it's perforated by the urethra in males and by the urethra and the vagina in females. That's what this hole is right here. And this hole is also called the urogenital hiatus. Urogenital hiatus. And also from what we saw in the previous slides, the perineal membrane does provide an attachment for some of the muscles of the external genitalia, okay? So now we're gonna continue going superiorly, a little bit deeper, peel off the perineal membrane, and now we're into what's called the deep perineal pouch. So remember the superficial perineal pouch, kind of in this diamond right here, formed a triangle, the lower half right here? Well, the deep perineal pouch does a similar thing. Okay, so here's the deep perineal pouch, and there's a muscle contained in there called the deep transverse perineal muscle. Here just labeled as deep perineal. You can see it right here. And hopefully the perspective in the video, you can see that the transverse perineal muscles, bulbospongiosis and ischio cavernosis are superficial to the deep perineal. You can see this kind of a little bit back in the picture. But there's one over here on the left, another over here on the right. And you can see those muscles over here. Now, the deep perineal pouch is a potential space between the deep fascia of the pelvic floor superiorly. That's really the levator ani that we'll see on the next slide. Again, we haven't gotten there yet, but we just got through the perineal membrane, which is inferior, because remember, we're going inferior to superior, so we got through the perineal membrane. Now we're in the deep perineal pouch, and if we keep going, we'll be in the levator ani. Now, the deep perineal pouch contains part of the urethra in both males and females, it also contains the external urethral sphincter, okay? So this hole right here, all of this is really that same hole. That's the urogenital hiatus, okay? So in females, which is what this is over here, we have the urinary part first, and then behind that we have the reproductive part for the vagina, and then back here is the anal part for the GI, okay? So both of those are contained in that urogenital hiatus in females. And then right here, most anteriorly, this is going to be the external urethral sphincter, what we see right there. And like we said in females, it also accommodates the vagina. And then the deep perineal pouch also contains the bulbo-urethral glands, which are in males, and also the deep transverse perineal muscles. Females have these too. This males, I think, was supposed to be after bulbo-urethral glands, okay? But obviously both males and females have these deep perineal muscles, okay? Now the deep perineal muscles have an origin on the inferior rami of the ischium on each side. So here's your ischium, okay? And that's where they originate from. And the fibers project medially. And then the insertion is gonna be the contralateral deep transverse perineal muscle on the other side. So here's your right one, here's your left one, and they cross and insert. Now obviously in the area where the vagina is, they're not going to traverse that, okay? It's only gonna be in the picture above it and below it. Okay. And they're innervated by the deep perineal nerve, as is everything here. And their action is to constrict the urethra and the vagina, which helps maintain urinary continence. Again, when you're trying to hold your urination to prevent yourself from peeing in your pants, it's really the superficial and deep transverse perineal muscles that help to constrict that urethra. That makes sense because, if we remember, this pouch contains part of the urethra. So by these muscles contracting, they help to kind of cut off that flow of urine. All right, if we keep going superiorly, a little bit deeper, we're actually gonna get to the deepest layer, and that is the levator ani muscle group, which is sometimes referred to as the pelvic diaphragm. We can actually see some of those muscles here. There's actually four of them, 
and those are puborectalis, pubococcygeus, iliococcygeus, and then ischiococcygeus, sometimes just called coccygeus. Now, out of these muscles, only these three right here, puborectalis, pubococcygeus, and iliococcygeus, only these three are what actually constitute the levator ani. Even though the coccygeus or ischiococcygeus is considered part of the pelvic diaphragm and the pelvic floor, only these three here are levator ani muscles. Okay? Now keep in mind the viewpoint. We're looking at an inferior to superior view. And yes, we can see some of these muscles. But if we really want to get a good view of puborectalis, pubococcygeus, iliococcygeus, and the ischiococcygeus, we really need to be doing a superior to inferior view. So instead of looking up, we actually want to look down. So we're going to do a pancake flip of the pelvis right here. So we're basically going to flip it 180 degrees like this, and now we're looking superior to inferior. Now we're looking down on the pelvis. And I think you probably recognize this. Over here we have the iliac fossa. Here's your PSIS. Here's the base of the sacrum uh, that L5 actually sits on, and then these are the sacral alla on either side. Here's the sacroiliac joint between the alla of the sacrum and the ilium right here. All this is your iliac crest, right? And then this would be your anterior superior iliac spine. Here's your anterior, your inferior iliac spine. And we can't see the ischial tuberosities here, but we can see the ischial spines on either side. And then, of course, this is the pubis and then the pubic symphysis. If we imagine starting out of the screen where you are and kind of going into the screen right here, we'd pass through this hole made up by the two halves of the pelvis and then the sacrum posteriorly. And that hole that we'd pass through would be the pelvic inlet, all right? And once we pass through the pelvic inlet, then we would get to the levator ani muscle group and the coccygeus. And there's a few other muscles that we'll look at and we're actually gonna do that in the next video. But hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the layers of the perineum and the pelvic floor and also the muscles of it. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.